Redefined is hosted by me, Zainab Salbi, and brought to you by Find Center, a search engine for your soul. Part library, part temple, Find Center presents a world of wisdom, organized. Check it out today at www.findcenter.com and please subscribe to Redefined for free on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. What's most important about life? What is the essence of life? Is it what we do? How much we earn? How many social media followers we have? Or is it, do we live our lives in kindness to ourselves and to others? Do we live our lives in love to ourselves and to others? In nearly losing my life, I was confronted with these questions, and it led me to the conversations that make up Redefined about how we draw our inner maps and the pursuit of meaningful personal change. My guest this week is CNN anchor and best-selling author, Don Lemon. Now every night, as I'm sure many of you do, I watch Don present the news on his CNN show as only he can, combining real talk and brilliant analysis with big-heartedness all his own. Our conversation today, though, serves to explore that big heart even more and to go deeper into some of Don's biggest challenges and what he's learned by living through them. And this is a man who has grieved a sister, embraced his sexuality, and worked tirelessly to understand and communicate what it means to be black in America. It takes courage to do that, and it takes a lot of risks, to be honest something that I really admire about Don and how he has taken it all the way to open his heart to the public wider and wider all the time. Hear more about how Don does it and all about his new must-read book, This is the Fire. I loved your book. Loved your book. Oh my gosh, thank you. I honestly and and you know I found and, and I'm sure everyone is asking you about all the content about the book. I personally loved about the the combination between the personal and the political. And there were words that came to me. Truth, love, reconciliation. I mean they're like words and I was like as I'm hearing it I was like wow, I love this book. So first question I have for you is like, tell me what made you decide to write it? This is the fire. Well, I was, you know, we were all last year sitting at home in quarantine, right? And uh, we were watching these horrible images pour out on our television, story after stories in it of, of, you know, Ahmaud Arbery being shot. Remember the shotgun on the street in in, uh, Brunswick, Georgia? And then Breonna Taylor happened and then George Floyd happened. And then these young people were out there really fighting for us and trying to pull us into not really the future. Well, not the now, but the future. And I just thought about the world that I was handing off to my great nephew. And then I thought about the most profound thing for me when it came to race that really changed me and touched me was uh, The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. And I said, I sat down and I said, what if I wrote something like that, uh, which was a, a tribute to James Baldwin and where I could dedicate it to my great nephews. And um, I started by writing a, a letter to my nephew, my great nephew, who was 13 years old. And um, the whole book just poured out within a couple of months after that. And so that was, I, I felt like I had to do it. Beautiful. Couple of months. Wow. It takes me much yeah. longer to write every book. <laughs> it takes a long time. So that was um, that was the reason I did it. Is is that was one reason I did it. But I, you know, you sit there every night and you sort of do the I do. You know, I talk about well, this happened and this happened and this is going on. And this is going on in the country, and I feel like sometimes I'm just doing play by play, almost like a, a a sports announcer, right? And so I felt like I needed to do something that would um, that would be that would last longer, that was more concentrated. And that couldn't be diluted over time. And so you can pick up this book and you still get the full effect of not only what this moment means, but the moments, you know, since James Baldwin 
uh, wrote his book, the, the Sweep of History Over Time and Racism in This Country, and then Going Into the Future. I, I just wanted something that was beautifully written and that came from my heart. And it did come from your heart. I actually really very much felt it. It wasn't only political. I, I'm curious about um, the process because it was very courageous, some of the things that you shared in the book on your personal journey. As a journalist, not every journalist want to share their personal journey. You know, it's, it's a risk almost to share your that that aspect, whether it is, you know, the story of, I mean, we have Baldwin and we have race in America and we have the politics, but you also talk about your molestation and you talk about your trip to Africa with your mother. And you, you talk about all of these aspects of it. And that is risky to show emotions as a journalist. How did you go about that? Did you, did it feel like a risk for you? It did. Um, well, anytime you're writing a book, you know, you're putting yourself out there for criticism from everybody. Right. And you're just kind of opening yourself. Oh, you're opening the door and you're saying, come on in, criticize me. So yeah, it did feel um, that way. And I, you know, I, I don't think that you can, it's something that this person, this, something that is this personal and that affects so many people, especially marginalized people and underserved people and people who, whose stories have not been written throughout history, it's vulnerability. You have to be vulnerable in order to do it. You have to be empathetic, you have to be vulnerable and you have to share yourself, uh, especially if you wanna to touch people. And I think the only way you can touch people is, is in a personal way, is through sharing my story and telling about my journey and how I feel, whether that's right or wrong, whatever you think it is, it's my story. This is how I feel. And so, yeah, it was tough to do. But if you watch me at night, you know, I'm very, I'm very open. I share everything. I think that's been a part of whatever success that I've had, whatever degree of success that I had, that I've just been really open and really vulnerable about it. And it gets tough. I mean, look, it's tough talking about this all the time, as you know. It's just, it can be exhausting and draining. And when you come home, when I come home, I just want to you know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to talk about it anymore because I talk about it for hours at work. But then, you know, I had to come home and write the book. And it's, it's been, it was, it wasn't easy. So yeah, you picked up on something, that, something that, you know, I think you, you can sense. Yeah. Well, I, I have. Yes. And you go home and home is Sag Harbor, Dan, and it's like the epicenter of white privilege. And I have lots of friends that I love there. So as I, some of them are common friends. I mean, but it's epicenter of white privilege, you know. Um, how do you reconcile that? And I ask you that from a very personal perspective. You know, uh, you know, the times I've been on the show, on your show, I've been talking about ISIS and Iraq and the invasion of Iraq and all of that. And I got to tell you, it, it is hard for me to reconcile between the rage and the anger and the pain at seeing my own home country destroyed by America to a great extent, not 100%, but to a great extent. And between the fact that I live in America and I love this country and I love my friends and that reconciliation between the pain and the anger and between the love and the joy is a constant challenge for me as a everyday challenge. How do you do it? What, 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 what's your philosophy about it? How do you handle it? Oh my gosh, the constant challenge. But the interesting thing do I, that I do have to say is that one reason I picked Sag Harbor is because of what it stood for. And that's, yeah, you know, I write about it in the book. I write about Mark K. Terry and her sister, Amazing Lee Meredith, and what they did and how they carved out the space and this land for, for Black people to have vacation homes. And so that was one of the reasons I picked Sag Harbor. But yeah, it is. And, you know, the interesting thing is that when you, you know, you, you said it's the epicenter of white privilege. I mean, there's, it's a lot of, there are a lot of middle-class people there, but that has nothing to do with, um, you know, with privilege, whether you're middle-class or whatever, or upper-class or whatever, money doesn't shield you from discrimination. And being poor in a way does affect that. But, but most people who are not of color <clears throat> in this country have an ease uh, and have come through a system that is really still built for them, whether they're poor or not. It's not really built for Black people. And if you, and if you look at the true history of the country, it has been to sort of, to not sort of, but to hinder Black people's progress. You know, slavery and Reconstruction and people realize, oh, you're starting to have political and, and financial 
uh, clout. We got to stop that, right? Jim Crow, um, peonage, um, you know, almost having people as indentured servants, the prison exchange program, and then on and on and on, voter restrictions and on and on and on to today, with again, with voter restrictions. So um, it's tough. It's something that I recognize, but um, I still believe that I have the freedom as an American to be able to live wherever I want. Well, it's not that actually the question was not about where you live. It's about how do you reconcile between the love and the pain and as you are encountering in your social life, in your personal life, in your even work life, frankly. Well, you know? well how do I reconcile the love and the pain? Well, right. That, I mean, on I, the one hand, you know, there's this, I mean, if I use my experience, I'm living in a country that helped destroy my country. And it's right. extremely painful that my own house is <laughs> erased, erased. You know, like yeah. all my family are refugees now. And this is not by choice. But my know, whole so. life has been a reconciliation. My whole life is reconciling yeah. that. that. Yeah. My whole yeah. life has been that way. And I think any, especially any black person in this country, that's your entire life of reconciling what, the, what, you, what America should be and the actual America that you live in. You, but one still has to live in this country and you still have to live among people and socialize with people. But I am, we're living in a time now, I feel, and I'm living in a body and in a space and in a mindset now where I have to hold people accountable, regardless of, of where they live and who they are. And so my, how I reconcile that is by holding people to account, by using the platform that I have, uh, not only in my professional life, but in my personal life as well. Because people ask me, things about my professional life in my personal life and i have to tell them so i i think holding people to account just as you said by making them aware that the country that you live in right has destroyed in in a big way your home country that hurts how do you reconcile that the country that i live in the same thing has done a lot to destroy the people my ancestors and that's painful but yet we still have to live in this country so, um, you know, it, it, and it's a weird sort of pull, right? Of yeah. war that you have. And I talk about, I do talk about that in a sense about, about people, black people living in the set mode, like ready, set, go, like running a race. And you're always on edge. And whether that's, whether it's true or not, you're always wondering, is this what's happening to me? You also talk about reconciliation in your book. And I found it interesting because you talk about the South African experience, you know, you talk about, but you, I didn't hear, and maybe I missed it. How do you believe reconciliation can happen in America? And can reconciliation happen in America? I think you, you believe it can, but what's the process? Um, oof, that, that's tough right now. You know, when I was writing the book, I probably would have said we're in the middle of the, the process or we're starting in the middle of it. We're starting the process now with the, you know, with the election, would it happen with the election? The insurrection that happened on, on Capitol Hill showed us that we were in the last vestiges of the last throes of racism. And I still do believe that of white supremacy, I should say, not racism, of white supremacy um, in this country. But now looking at what's happening with voter restrictions, that process is going to be even harder. The process of reconciliation, reconciliation is going to be even harder because you have people who are trying to take away one of the fundamental rights that we have in this country. And I believe the biggest fundamental right, and that's the right to vote and to be able to choose who we have as leaders and the direction of the world or the country and really taking away agency. And so I look, I don't know what the answer is. I'm not a politician. Maybe I should be. Um, but I think that now the only party that can help to save our democracy is a democratic party. And I'm not a political person because the Republicans now are operating in a place of non-truth, of um, trying to limit people's ability to, to have rights and really just lying and, and gaslighting and just they just want to win at every turn. And so I don't know what's going to help. I think Democrats need to have a backbone and stand up and fight for the democracy. Otherwise, we're in deep doo-doo. But I think it, it, it's really going to come, if it's going to come, it's from all of these people who want, who are right-minded, and I don't mean right or left-leaning, but have the right mindset to get together and realize their power. The underserved people of all different ethnicities, Black people, poor whites, uh, Latinos, women, all of these people in our society who have been underserved and, and unrepresented pretty much by the government have to get together and stand up 
and fight for this country and not allow po politicians to co-opt um, and to exploit, to exploit us. Then we'll be able to start the process of reconciliation, no matter what the politicians try to do, no matter what the larger culture tries to do as of now to hang on to power as the demographics start to dwindle and we become a minority majority country. Brilliant. So first reconciliation, as I'm hearing from you, is, starts with actually righting the wrong. Yes. <laughs> and then only then can then we talk about, okay, how do we reconcile for the future? Yeah, but righting that wrong, I said, is going to be tough because yes, by yes. restricting people's ability to be able to choose their own leaders is not righting yeah. a wrong. It's actually yeah. regression. Yeah. Yeah, but we are in the fight of righting the wrong right now yes, in the yes, middle of it. Are. Talking about righting the wrong, I happen to live in Edward R. Merrow's house. Actually, it's a log cabin upstate New York, and it happens a combination of a happenstance and intentionality on the on behalf of the sellers. And so I read, I sat reading Edward R. Merrow's book, you know, yeah. and who I wish found... I could smoke a cigarette like that at night, even though I'm a novel. <laughs> And just sit there at night and talk to people. With exactly. My well, these days we can smoke other things as well. It's a log cabin <laughs> here. So. <laughs> but I, so I started reading his book, right? His autobiography. And I was like, honestly, it was like, wow, he wrote the speech. He delivered the speech. I don't know if you remember the speech he gave in 1959 to the Association of Radio and TV Um Radio and Television News Director Association, 1958. And I want to read you a paragraph of it and see what you think about it. And he is talking about the media. He says, sometimes there's a clash between the public interests and the corporate interests. Upon occasions, economic and editorial judgment are in conflict. He goes on and says, I mean, he, he says a lot of interesting things, but this is one of the interesting paragraphs I find it that he says, it may be that the present system can survive. Perhaps the money making machine has some kind of built in perpetual motion, but I do not think so. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable and complacent. Our mass media reflects that. But unless we get up, our, we get up of our fat surpluses and recognize that television is being used to distract dilute, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it may see a totally different picture too late. I began by saying that our history will be what we make of it. If we go on as we are, then history will take its revenge and retributions will not limp in catching us in catching up with us. Do you think he was prescient in his assessment of the future of journalism as we are, you know, just surviving an era where journalists were called the enemy of the state, where, you know, talking about Republican, but where you have a lot of journalism in this country that is not about the truth and it's about commercial interests. What do you think about his, his some of his speeches? I mean, the, the, what I wrote. I think he was brilliant. Listen, I mean, obviously he was, yes, he was prescient. He was living in a different time. I, I just wonder what he would have thought of social media. And maybe it's that, you know, saying, you know, what he's saying there basically is one day the chickens are going to come home to roost. And I think they, they are because we haven't used, he mentioned in that specifically television, he said, those who fund television. Um, listen, I don't think, obviously the last administration was, you know, used, uh, the power of the pulpit to attack the institution of journalism. Uh, and I think in more ways than one, it was usually someone on television because the last administration was obsessed with cable television. Although he did attack the Washington Post and the New York Times and he called us fake news media. But I do think Edward R. R. Murrow is right. And that, and, and which is the reason why I conduct myself, saying that the way that I do every single night on television or and whenever I have the opportunity to to speak to people through this medium or the medium of journalism. The reason that I speak with such honesty and bluntness and frankness is because there is a lack of it so much in so many places. And I'm not talking about the, the folks who are doing good, legacy media, people who have standards and practices and, and rules and believe in facts. But there are people, members, there's, there are organizations that call themselves news, news organizations that don't deserve that title, news. It should be entertainment program. Quite frankly, it should be Fox Entertainment 
program or Fox Entertainment Channel instead of the Fox News Channel because they don't have to operate in facts. It's a, a lot of it is fiction and it's made, it's made to entertain an audience and to reaffirm already long held beliefs. And a lot of those beliefs center around white supremacy, right? And, and a structure for the country that has been put into place that they think should continue to stay that way. So um, do, do I think that uh, Edward R. Murrow was right? Absolutely. Do I think that we're paying the price for things that those who came before us did? Yes. Do I think the people who, as he said, have funded television and have used it, especially the news portion of television, and have used it for profit, uh, are they to blame? Yes. And, but I do think that that goes beyond the journalists on television. That's above our pay grade. We don't decide those things. We only operate within that, that, that ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that we need to change and, and maybe if journalism wasn't for profit, part of the for profit wing of an organization, that perhaps there would be more rules and there wouldn't be such um, competition for money above any, everything. Politics would not have such a stronghold in this medium and that it can be covered and dealt with fairly. So uh, in, in a sense, I will agree with what he says, but I do think that Edward R. Murrow, as great and as beloved as he is and was, um, is operating at a time that was quite different than we were operating at. It's true. I actually have to read you because you talk about the nonprofit. He said, there is no suggestion here that networks or individual stations should be operated as, uh, as philanthropies. But I, can, but I can find nothing in the Bill of Rights or in the Communication Act, which says that they must increase their net profits each year, lest the republic collapse. So it is about, you know, it's, it's in the nuances. But I mean, I guess the question is what can, what needs to be redefined in the media sector? And one of the things I hear from you is call it entertainment, like called Fox Entertainment. You should call entertainment, know? entertainment. You yeah. should, listen, every night when I, uh, when I give at the beginning of my show what I call my take, it is called Don's take, right? And when I, I will also say in my um, estimation, I try not to give my opinion because I don't do opinion journalism. I give my point of view as an American, as an American who happens to be black, who happens to be gay, who lives in this society and in this country and in this world now. I'm giving my point of view, but everything I say is based in fact, and it must be based in fact. And so, and I think that people can do that. You can give an analysis of something without lying about it or trying to co-opt or corrupt people. And, and, I, and I do think that Many of the organizations who call them, or a number of the organizations who call themselves news organizations, they don't do that. They just can make up things and lead their audience astray. And then what happens? You get an insurrection on Capitol Hill from people who don't have the correct information, from people, from people who are believing in lies because you have told them those lies. And um, then they end up being prosecuted. But I think with people who are operating on facts, on the correct, especially the correct history in this country, if the entire history of this country was told and those who contributed, I think you'd have less of a possibility of people who are ending up um, trying to overthrow the government on the day that an election is supposed to be certified and then continuing to believe in the lies of a leader who, is, who finds it impossible to tell the truth. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I want to switch to the personal because this podcast is called redefined. And yes. Dan, I don't know if you know, but I actually, you know, disappeared out of the world because I found myself in the ICU struggling between life and death and thinking that I'm taking my last breath um, a couple of years ago. And it took me a year to slowly, step by step, breath by breath to come, I, I don't call it come back to life, I call it arrive back to my heart, actually, it's arrive to, not back, I arrived we to do. my, you know, and, and, but in the process, I learned that, wow, all the things that I have defined about my life were actually irrelevant as I am, you know, in that moment between life and death, which is not a moment, it became a year, you know, and I started deciding, I, I, I need to understand what is the most essence what's the most important things about life and how have turning moments in people's lives told them about the most important things about life and i want to ask you a question about your sister death because when you um narrated it you uh oh my god you made me cry let me say i'm gonna cry now um it took me back to my own loss of my own mother 
and I really appreciate how you put your heart in it in a very beautiful way. What have that death taught you? Oof. That part, that part of the book was the hardest to read. It took me forever. I couldn't get the words out. Um, and when I finally would, you know, when I could get enough breath in my lungs to be able to read it, I couldn't see it because I was crying. What did that, what did that loss mean to me? Is that the, the no, correct? what it has, what has it taught you about life, about the most important things about life? Well, it, the interesting thing is, 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 you know, when you can hear it from your mom or from your mentors, it's like, you know, brush things off. Don't worry about people. Don't let other people influence you. Don't worry about what people think about you or what people say about you. Don't hold on to, to things. If people want to walk out of your life, let them walk out. If someone criticizes you, it's not necessarily about you. It's, it, it can be about them and don't let that um, penetrate. What my sister's death gave me was, I shouldn't say as a devil may care attitude, but I really don't give a you know what about what you think about me. It gave me an urgency about life and leading my life, leaning into my life, those who I love and where I want my life to go, whichever waters I would choose. I may choose, you know what, I'm, today I'm going, to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go away from the river and I'm going to go into the ocean because that's where I think the, the path is for me. So it gave me that. I have a sense of urgency about what I'm going to do with my, my platform every single day and every single night. I don't, you know, people, there was something in the news now where someone on another channel is spewing all this stuff about me and, and people were saying, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because it just doesn't penetrate me. I just don't, I don't really care. And so, as I say in the book, what did I say? If, uh, uh, I forgot how I write it, but if it's, you know, that, you, that my opinion or something that I say can piss you off, then, you know, that sort of brings me joy or whatever. I forget how I write it in, in the book. I'd have to go back to the line. But if, if you care enough about what I say that I can affect you and you piss you off and you can criticize me, okay, fine. That's your business. It doesn't mean that I have to respond to it. It doesn't mean that it has to affect me at all. I've gone through the death of my sister. I mean, it just the sudden death of my sister. I've lost my father. I lost my stepdad. I lost my grandmother. I don't know how long I'm going to be on this earth. So every single moment that I have, I'm going to use it the way that I want to use it. And so you do the same thing. And if, and if you want to use that moment by criticizing me or saying something bad about me, then have fun. But it doesn't mean that I have to allow it to affect me. I am a completely emancipated person. So I live the way I want to live and I live with joy. It doesn't mean that I don't have my struggles and, and concerns and worries or whatever, but I love being Don Lemon and I'm going to continue to do that regardless of what profession that I'm in. And I'm going to, and one thing I am going to do is use the voice that I have to speak for people who cannot speak, who don't, who didn't have the privilege to be able to um, hold our government and officials accountable during a, a, a 100 year pandemic, right? Something that happens only can happen in a, in a hundred years, a deadly pandemic where hundreds of thousands of people died. As tough as it was for me, I know it was tougher for other people, but every night I could get there and say, you screwed up. Where are the answers? How are you going to help people? And that's quite a blessing to be able to have. And I'm going to continue to do that for as long as I can. And I don't care what you say. You can say, stop talking about the January 6th. I'm not. It doesn't affect me. I'm going to continue to do it. Stop you know, talking about race. You're a race baiter. I'm not a race baiter, but I'm going to talk about what's important. This is important for us. Stop talking about, you know, women and women have every, I'm going to continue to fight for women and for gay people, LGBTQ community, and for black people and for Latino people and for Asian people and for Muslims and for every, and for Native Americans. Because I am, I'm sorry. Sorry, not sorry. That's it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, it reminds me, I had a teacher once told me, she said, live every single day as if it's your last day, which means yeah. live it fully. And she said, yeah. because the day you die, you don't want to say, oh, God, please give me another month or another year to do this and live it every day. Give Urgency. it your all. And it seems that you're giving every day your all. I all give every that. day my all. But guess what I've learned to do? And I shouldn't say learn because I've always done this. 
But if like today is a, you know, a rainy, cloudy day in New York City, if I want to sit in bed, I'm going to stay in bed and say, oh, you're missing the day. No, I'm not. I'm enjoying being here. I'm, I'm watching old, you know, Law and Order episodes because it's just like, it's, it's bliss for me. I don't have to think about anything, right? I just want Love to be here. Do you know what I'm saying? I completely know. I have a new word for instead of FOMO, it's JOMO, the joy of missing out. Joy. I love that. <laughs> Don't Can I say. steal that? Can I Please use that? Do. It's yours. You know, like if you want to lay in bed and watch Law and Order, which is my favorite, actually, you yeah. know, it's JOMO. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Done. I mean, as I was reading again your book, I uh, it reminds the word that comes to me as I think of you is courage, the 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 courage to speak, you know, and and you are, I, you know, I want to take you back to your memoir, transparent, you know, because I think I don't know if that was your your most courageous, and then since then you've. You've taken the flag uh, of courage and moved it forward to speak on behalf of everyone and for everyone. But I want to ask you a question about that, because it's one thing to come out to the world and speak about the larger political issue. I'm speaking about my experience. It's quite another to speak about our own personal stories, you know, especially if it's, you know, you grew up with, for me, you know, when I spoke about my story, I had to like, handle my shame and my worry about my family and my, you know, my community. Oh, my God, what's going to happen to me? I wasn't thinking about what, you know, the media and, and is going to say. My, as my father says, do whatever you want to say outside um, Iraq, but please don't say anything in Iraq. <laughs> how did, you know, how did you decide and what's the process? Not how. What's the process that made you decide that I need to come out? And how has your family and community held you in that process? Oof, that was, uh, okay, it's like jumping in the water, right? And knowing that you're going to go under for a while and then you'll pop back up like a buoy, hopefully. You know, this was actually a decade ago. This was 10 years ago when I was writing Transparent. And, you know, I got to that. I was writing, Transparent was sort of a memoir, my journeys and journalism, right? Like, so, you know, this is where I am as a journalist. This is who I am. It was sort of an, you know, an introductory, an introduction to the, the audience beyond CNN. I was writing about my, you know, my life and my, my career, my journeys in journalism, and just about me personally. And I got to this point in the book where I said, and then I moved to New York City. And I was like, well, I need to tell people why I moved to New York City. And if I leave that part out, then I'm not being honest. I'm not being candid. I'm, I'm, um, it was a lie by omission. And I wasn't going to lie to people by omission because I hold people, I wanted to hold people to the same set of rules and to, and to account the way that I hold, that I want to hold myself to, to account and by the same rules that I hold other people, especially the people who I interviewed on television. Um, and so I just said, I've got to say it. And it's whatever happens, happens, because if I don't, then I've, not, I've missed an opportunity to be able to help people. And I'm just not being honest as a, as a journalist and I'm not being honest as a person. And so I wrote it and I put it in there and I said, I can put it in there, but then I don't miss, I can always take it out. They were like, you can always take it out. And I said, okay, okay, okay. And I put it in, they said, and they called me and they said, um, all right, we got it. We're going to go publish. You want to leave this? And I said, yeah, leave it. And uh, that was it. But I thought that uh, after this book that I, I wouldn't have a career, that people wouldn't watch me, that, you know, my family and people would laugh and say, I told you he was, you know, an F word or he was gay or a homo or a sissy or a punk and all, all that stuff. And I said, you know what? Whatever. And it turned out to, I think, to be the right thing. You know, Zainab, there were people who told me, even representatives who said, do you want to be always want to be known as the gay anchor? And back then I was like, no, I don't actually. And then now I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course I do. Like, you know, and that was, it's a whole sort of shame and, and internalized homophobia that, that, you know, you have in you 
because that's the way it is. It was ingrained and you thought it was bad. And now I don't think being gay is bad. So if someone calls me the gay anchor, I'll be like, oh, hey, here I am. What's up? <laughs> you know, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. But back then we thought it was. So it was, yes, it was really tough. I already had, and you know, the reason that I think my, my mom and, you know, my family members may have had some hesitancy about it is because they felt that I already had one mark against me. I'm already black in this, in this society. And why do you want to add something else? And do you know? And the whole thing: Do people have to know who you sleep with and what you do in the bedroom? And I'm like, well, I'm not telling people what I do in the bedroom or exactly who I'm sleeping with. I'm just telling them that who I am, and I want to be able to share a story about someone I'm seeing or my dating life, just as you do every single day, or your married life, married life, or your children, or whatever. Just as you do every single day or what you did on vacation or the fishing trip you went on with your family. I want to be able to have that same right and ease as an American and joy as an, as an American to be able to do that as a human being. And so um, I left it in there and there it is. I hope I did. Did I do okay? Was it the right decision? Oh my gosh. I mean, it, you make me think of freedom is an inside job and you got your freedom. And you know what I learned when I told my truth and the utter truth to the world, which is similar to your process is my fear. I, I was the fear itself. You know, I was the fear and the prison guard for it. You know, like I was keeping my fear fed every single day. And when I broke it, I was like, wow. I know, but then you bring, you bring other people along with you. You educate everyone around you. And I think exactly. that you help them to evolve. You don't realize you're the gravitational pull that you have. And I don't mean, you know, down, yeah. but you help to elevate people, I should say. Exactly. Yeah. Ever since I broke my fear and I spoke the truth, is it be, truth became speaking the truth, telling the truth, living the truth became my motto in life because it's so much First of all, it's delicious to start with, and it's so liberating. Don, I have a few last questions, rapid questions in here. Is there a song that makes you feel empowered and brave that you always go to? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind probably is, you know, a Marvin Gaye song, What's Going On. That's, that always make, makes me feel empowered because I, I think of him. I just did a documentary on him. But I've always loved that the album, the entire album, what's going on. But I love the song, too, because it's a genius of asking people a question and um, challenging them to answer it. That's beautiful. Yeah. Is there a prayer, a poem, a piece of art that lifts your spirit? Oh, yeah. Well, Psalms 91 is um, something that lifts my spirit. And there's a poem that's by... Um, Shaw Silverstein, listen to the mustn'ts, shall listen to the don'ts, listen to the will and to the impossible, the won'ts, listen to the never haves and listen close to me. Anything can happen, child, anything can be. That uplifts my spirit. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. How about movies, you know, that you go to for a either a good cry or renew your I have movies that renew my beliefs and the triumph of good over evil do you have any you're, you're talking to someone who cries over commercials <laughs> uh, look, I love old movies uh look I loved you know movies like and I know this people are gonna people criticize now because we're living in this sort of woke space I cry on movies like to kill a mockingbird makes me cry the one that I that makes me want to be a better writer is all about Eve because it's so beautiful. <laughs> and, and I love Imitation of Life is one of my favorite movies. But the one that makes me cry that I have to watch every year is It's a Wonderful Life. I cry like a baby every single year on It's a Wonderful Life. And what else? Um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Sidney Poitier is a, is a really good one because it's, it teaches people about, you know, falling in love with someone who doesn't look like them, who comes from a completely different world. So yeah, but I love old movies. I'm an old movies person. You share that in your book, actually. I yeah, remember I that. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'll check these yeah. movies out. Some of them I don't, some of them I do. Yeah. Are there mentors or teachers beside your mother, who I know is you're very close to, but you know, what, what teachers or mentors that had, you know, inspired you? Well, it's weird because he was a mentor in my head before I even met him and it's T.D. Jakes. People, you know, people think that it's a kind of odd relationship that we have, but we do. If I ever need something really, you know, I listen to him every day, his sermons. But if I really need to call him, I can pick up a, a cell phone and call him. And, you know, I have other people like that who I, you know, who 
who are like family members who we fight and we love each other. We get along. Tyler Perry is one. If I have, if I need to talk to someone about something that re- something that really means something, I can call him and, and say, Hey, look, I need to talk to you about something and he will give it to me straight. And last one, is there a book? Your favorite book, you go for solace or strength. Right here. James Baldwin. Oh, James Baldwin. Love it. The fire next time. And this is one of my oldest copies right here. Oh, love yeah. it. Love yeah. it. I love that. I love that. I love your book. This is the fire. Can we see it? Do you have it around you? I, don't I do. Know. I have yeah. the yeah. fire next time by James Baldwin. And then I have Fabulous. the fire by Don Lemon. Well, James would be proud of you. We all Thank are. You. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm really honored and privileged to have this conversation with you. It's so good to see you. And I hope to see you in person, okay? I look forward to. Thank you. You be well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. And that was Don Lemon. His new book is This Is The Fire. You can follow Don on Instagram at DonLemonCNN. You can follow me at Zainab Salbi and follow Find Center at Find underscore Center. For transcripts and other resources from this episode, please go to www.findcenter.com slash redefined. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week for another conversation about life's turning points and lessons learned. My guest will be author and Buddhist spiritual leader, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. Redefine is produced by me, Zainab Selby, along with Rob Carso, Casey Khan, and Howie Khan at Freetime Media. Our music is by John Palmer. Special thanks to Neil Goldman, Jan Tardif, Elijah Townsend, Amanda Graber, Jesse Stormo, and Dan Lemon's team at Little Brown and CNN.